everyone. Um, welcome to. Sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this session on AI and regulatory challenges. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce to you your panel. On my right is Yafit Lev Aretz um, from the City University of New York, and to her right, Littel Hellman from Ono Academ Academic College, and further down, Alina Trapova from Bocconi University. And on the far end is Felix Olugmayo from University of Lorin. Um, and today they'll be presenting on four different but very related um, issues. And I'm just going to introduce them in slightly more detail one by one and hand the time over to them. And after they've done their presentations of 15 minutes each, we'll open the floor to questions. So um, Yafit is an assistant professor of law at the Clean School of Business, Barry College, City University of New York. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Second. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, City University of New York, as I was saying. Um, she's also a research fellow at the Tau Center at Columbia Law Journalism School. And um, she was previously a research fellow at Information Law Institute at NYU and an intellectual property fellow at the Kernukan Center for Law, Media and the Arts at Columbia University. Yafit's um, research concerns self-regulatory regimes set up by private entities and the legal vacuum they create, um, as well as the growing use of algorithmic decision making and intrusive means of news dissemination. And for those who were here earlier this week, um, on choice architecture in the age of big data and ethical challenges posed by machine learning and artificially intelligent systems. Um, Littel is a senior lecturer at the Ono Academic College Faculty of Law in Israel. She holds an SJD from the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Um, and she also served as a fellow with the Kernokan Center at Columbia University Law School and with the Engelberg Center at New York University School of Law. And her research focuses on IP law and law and technology. And she's published in various leading journals around the world. Alina has her LLB from the University of Sheffield in the UK, LLM in IP law at Queen Mary University of London. And she's also worked in legal policy within the IFPI, the international body representing the recording industry worldwide, and with the EU IPO's Boards of Appeal um, and has experience in the private legal sector, tech startup counseling, and IP conference management. At um, Bocconi University in Milan, she's pursuing a doctorate degree as well as teaching various IP related courses. And her research focuses on copyright licensing, copyright ownership, and machine learning. And last but not least, Felix. Um, Felix has degrees, um, a bachelor degree from University of Ilorin. Um, a, a baccalaureate from Nigeria Law School and a master's degree in law from the University of Lagos and he's currently rounding off a master's program in international law and diplomacy at the University of Lagos and has undertaken a PhD program at the University of Ilorin as well and he has extensive experience um, in legal advisory services um, with clientele covering local and transnational corporations and lots of background in dispute resolution as well. And so without further ado, um, I'm going to welcome Yafit to start her presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, first of all, thank you so much for coming to this panel because the competition is, is, is really difficult. I, I must admit that I myself am not sure that I, will, that I would come to this panel because the other one is also so very interesting, so thanks for staying. Um, and also a special thanks for those who are hearing this project, I think for the f second or third time, at least three of you or four of you that I see in the room. Um, I will try to actually add some new things that are not in the paper uh, for you guys, but um, thanks again for sticking around. So, 
the term data philanthropy refers to donations, as, as in free of charge, of private sector data, access to it, or the production of data-driven insights for a socially beneficial purpose. Now, before I move on, I'll just remove one common point of controversy out of the way. The term philanthropy is historically, politically, and um, socially loaded, and for good reasons. I disagree with the use of the term to describe the use of corporate data for social good, and have an almost almost completed paper um, about why this term is not only inaccurate conceptually, but also legally, it's hard to talk about philanthropy. Um, but for the purpose of this research, because the conversation both in academia and industry have used this term, I use it here in the paper in order to join this existing conversation, um, but I do want to highlight my opposition to this term. Um, now, now that this is out of the way, let me give you one example of data philanthropy. So, April 2015 brought the most destructive earthquake that Nepal has ever known. And in the course of an earthquake, the first, first thing that people are doing is moving around, changing places. That's a very healthy human instinct. At the same time, it makes the lives of rescuer very, very difficult because they don't know where people are located. However, we're moving around with a personal GPS tracking device, right? Our, our cell phones, our smartphones. So it's very easy today to know, using mobile data, where people are located. So before that earthquake, slightly before, a nonprofit organization from Sweden called Flowminder collaborated with Ensel, the local phone company in Nepal. Ansel provided access to anonymized mobile data, and the Flowminder were able to build um, population displacement maps that could tell in real time where people are located, not only at this very moment, but also in a minute, in an hour, in a day, in, even in a week. And that was a game changer for disaster relief. After th that specific earthquake was a very different reaction and they were able um, to address people's needs in real time um, using that mobile data or using the, the maps that use the mobile data. So while working on this paper, I conducted interviews with uh, many industry players. Some of them asked to remain um, anonymous and some of them you can see them on the slide. And um, this is the part that is not part of the paper. Uh, so those are themes that came up in the interview, in the interviews, that I found really, really interesting and that I would like to share with you guys. And because Niva mentioned this morning that this conference is about research and promoting research and conversations, um, I, aside from the privacy issue, which I, which I do tackle in this specific paper, I did not touch on any of these yet. But I invite you or anyone who is interested to actually look at these. So in the interviews, one of the themes that came up is the forms of sharing. So some companies open the data completely. They will just post the database online and allow everybody who is interested to access the data. Other companies allow full access, but for specific um, parties. So for example, researchers. Twitter did that. LinkedIn did that. Uh, some would work in, in a form of collaboratives, which means that we're going to have um, in-house researchers from that institution, from that company, sorry, collaborating with academic researchers most of the time, or from people from the government, and they will work together on a research project or on a social problem, and, um, and the access to the data is only available because of this collaboration, because we have in-house employees that kind of guard this um, access. And, um, in terms of incentive for sharing, I was really surprised when I interviewed some of those companies. What do you think the first incentive for sharing, um, or the most prominent one that came up in the interviews was? Why would they share data? Why would corporate players share data? Publicity, right? That's what I thought. I thought that the first one, or more imp most important one, would be kind of PR, reputational reasons. Uh, and it did, it did come up a lot, so IMS Health, for example, told me, and that's not a secret, that they have a, um, a number that they aim for of academic sightings in publications. So they want academic journals, articles, to cite IMS databases, or the access that people get to the, to the databases in research. Um, and that's absolutely just a reputational consideration. But I was also maybe naively surprised to find out 
that in other companies, and excuse me for not uh, giving you the, the specific one, but it's on the slide, uh, in other companies, um, the incentive for sharing was not reputational the way we think about it. So it's not about having the public knowing that you share this data for good. It was about having lawmakers, regulators, policymakers know that this is how we use our data. So one of the companies, when I interviewed them, um, they said, we never publish, we don't have press releases about sharing the data. All we care about is that when we lobby for our causes, we have all those initiatives of sharing data for good that we can point at. And I thought that was really interesting. Uh, also interesting is the corporate-based academia. So for the legal profession or for um, maybe social sciences as well, it's hard for us to, to envision that because we really place hard borders on when we are academics and when we work for a private company. But for example, in computer science and information science, there is a revolving door. You'll see the same people who are full professors, for example, and have full academic positions during the year going over the summer to work for different companies. So there is a constant revolving door. And some of them eventually uh, leave and move to the, the, the corporate settings. And one of the people I interviewed told me she used to be a professor. Um, it doesn't matter which university, but she told me, now I have more postdocs and PhD students at my disposal than I used to have when I was a professor in that school. So we, this is something we need to keep a close eye on because whereas in traditional academia we have a very clear sense of independence and um, objectivity, um, it's not entirely clear that we have the same on the corporate side. <coughs> also, uh, kind of follow, flow, following up, uh, up on that specifically, different research ethics standards for those of you who are familiar with the contagious study that Facebook uh, conducted some years ago. Um, it was a study that um, basically interfered with people's newsfeed and they wanted to check the influence on people and whether they become depressed as a result. And it actually connects beautifully to my talk from yesterday about choice architecture. Um, after that, they got a lot of bad publicity, and uh, the people at Facebook told me and we brought in someone from MIT to run the uh, research ethics department for Facebook, and now we have clear rules of how, what are, our res what are the research ethics standards, and when I asked uh, to know what they are, they said, no, <laughs> we can't let you know that. Um, so also transparency issues. Um, it was also interesting to see the difference between employees and researchers' ad ideologies. So many of the employees I spoke with sincerely believed that they are changing the world, that they are doing something great for the greater good. And um, they know that there is corporate agenda and that there are economic interests, but they, I, they are really sincerely operating out of this um, feeling that they are on a mission for the greater good. Um, and the last point, privacy views. When I spoke to people about privacy, it was very interesting to see that they all, really all, viewed privacy more as a compliance issue than as an ethical guideline or standard. Okay, so all, everything I told you up to now is not in the paper. It's just like interesting anecdotes from the interviews. How am I on time? Five minutes left. Okay. I'm going to rush through this, but when I started working on data philanthropy, I found that there is a lot of literature about data philanthropy on computer science, social science, economics, information science, business, and philosophy. However, when I turned to my own field, the law, I found nothing, absolutely zero. And I was uh, quite surprised at first, but then I realized that there are two actually very reasonable reasons for that. The first one is that the practical need is overstated. We have terms of service, and especially in the context of sharing data for socially beneficial purposes, almost everything can be put into the terms of service um, and used. Also, most of these um, fields where I did find a lot of academic work on data philanthropy um, called for, specifically called for legal guidance on privacy. 
So this submission is also even more striking, right? But specifically for the privacy community, think of the people who work, about, or who work on privacy. We are spending our lives, dedicating our lives to fighting illegitimate collection and use and, and data practices. And now you ask us to step aside and say, you know what, this data is there. Let's think about the beneficial uses. That's whitewashing. That's the fruit of a poisonous tree, to borrow from a another legal discipline. Um, but as, as you can see, I think it's still a very, very important task. And I think that by staying out of the conversation, we actually um, get the worst from all worlds because we don't provide any guidance on beneficial sharing and you know, illegitimate collection and use is still happening. Um, so speaking specifically about privacy, data philanthropy brings a lot of legal issues, tax and education, a lot of, of issues. I focus specifically about uh, on privacy in this paper. And one of the things I was really curious about is whether privacy really is the problem that is claimed to be. And I found that when people talked about privacy as an impediment for data philanthropy, the first one, the first reason why it was making data philanthropy um, difficult is compliance. And absolutely not. I think this is overstated through terms of service and de-identification. A lot of data philanthropy initiatives already took place and many will uh, will take place. The Future of Fri Privacy Forum had a study that showed that even in highly regulated industries, sharing took place uh, when the company was interested in that. So compliance is a non-issue. Um, same with identification, okay? Same with identification. Um, it's true that the identification is not the answer and we know that by now, but they're through differential privacy and also they placed on top of the identification structural um, limitations. So it's not like everyone can access this data. They only allow specific people under specific restraints to access the data. So identification is also not really a problem. I do think that the other, um, the other themes that came up also in the interviews is broader informational risks. So there are risks like bias and error and discrimination and profiling and choice architecture and manipulation that we care about in the context of sharing data. But it's not strictly privacy. It's broader informational risks and we need to think about them this way. And also, most of them just wanted some form of legal recognition for this practice. Uh, which is what I do in the paper um, and I offer uh, an exception to the fair information practice principles, specifically to the purpose specification and use limitation that stand in sharp controversy with data philanthropy. Um, this is the framework, and the paper will be on SSRN very soon. So if anyone is interested in discussing more, I can discuss more. But I think you can get that from the paper if you're interested. I think it was more important to share the themes from the interviews that I cannot publish, um, but I can share in academic conferences like this. So thank you very much. Hi, great to be here. Thank you very much for um, for being here. Um, I actually, I don't know. I think this panel is great, or the, the first speaker was great. And um, the idea that um, that this paper is bringing is about the patent system. But um, the first the first uh, question that I want to answer is why why is this even important? Why is it so important to talk about the decentralized patent system? And the reason is that the patent system is probably the paradigmatic case for a system where um, the, the, the structure is probably n not less important than the rules that we have for patent law. Because think about it, uh, in, in the patent system, there is a, the PTO in the United States, or there is a patent office that receives a lot of inventions, and they decide which ones are going to get exclusive rights and which ones are not getting exclusive rights. So more, th or, or at least as important as deciding what these exclusive rights are going to, to give 
the inventors, it's as important to say, to make sure that the, that the system is capable of making good decisions of who is eligible and who is not eligible to make such a system, to, make such a, to, to get these exclusive rights. So this is why this is a very important question. Is the patent system, uh, is this the structure that we have now, is it the right one, is it the wrong one, and how, how we should change it if, uh, if we should. Um, before we start, maybe a few words about the blockchain. Uh, do, do you need uh, any small intro? It's always good. So, um, and until, and until now, um, the, the, the importance of, of, of this is that uh, what this paper proposes in the end of the day is to move or, uh, or partially move parts of what the patent system is currently doing into the blockchain and use uh, both the capability of blockchain and of AI in order to, to create a better system. This is why it's so important. So uh, the blockchain is, in a, is, is a database. Basically, it's a database. It's called a decentralized database. But maybe the best way to explain it is to say why this is so important. So let's think for a second about the internet. The internet is a wonderful system. Let's say I have a paper and I want to share it with Helen, for example. I send it to Helen by mail and now Helen has a copy of my, my paper and I also have a copy of my paper and it works perfectly in the world of papers. But it doesn't work perfectly at all in other world. Think of money, for example. Let's say that I wanted to send Helen uh, $100. No, I don't want to raise expectations. I'm not going to. And let's say I would, I would, I would send $100 to Helen, and then, um, and then the system would not reflect the fact that she has the $100 and I don't have a $100. If I would just send her $100 over the system of the internet that we currently have, it, it would look like she has a hundred dollar and I have a hundred dollar and this is not reality. Imagine I could send the same hundred dollars to Helen, to Neva and to everyone else here and I would still have this hundred dollar. This is wrong. So we did, we did not have a decentralized system that could do that. We only had systems like the credit card uh, companies do. They have systems where they can add $100 to one person's account and reduce it from another person's account. But this is only, only possible, or was only possible until recently, on a centralized system that one person or one company controls, and then they can make sure that all these transactions are reflected. But it wasn't available in a decentralized way like the internet. And this is what the blockchain was supposed to solve. In on the blockchain, everyone has a copy of the database, to put it very simply, everyone has a copy of the database, on, the, um, on, their, on their own system. And then everything that some one person on the system, on the network is doing, is reflected on everybody's networks. And therefore, if I give Helen $100, this is written now on everyone's paper, on everyone's computers. We're talking about blockchain now. Uh, and then, um, and then I cannot give these $100 again. Not only that, but when I finish one transaction, this, the transaction is closed. I cannot now go and change it. I cannot make any changes to what was done. This is closed in a block, it's blocked. And then if someone, if Helen wants to send these $100 to someone else, she opens a new block that comes after this block and she uses these hundred dollars and this is registered again as a new transaction, as a new block. The, and then this creates a chain of blocks and this is why the name blockchain, this is how the name blockchain came into existence. So this is the idea of blockchain and uh, now that we know that, um, we, can, uh, we can continue to see why this has been uh, or can work on the patent system. Because the blockchain idea was created for money, it was created a long time ago. But the, and since, since it was created, we are looking for uses for blockchain. It's been tried for, um, uh, for money, and at least I lost a lot of money on, uh, on this uh, Bitcoin bubble, and I guess other people in the crowd did as well. Um, but, uh, but then other places have tried to use it uh, in, uh, in, in titles of, of, uh, of houses and in other places. And I think this is one place where it can actually be beneficial. So let's look about the current regime of, um, uh, of, of patent law. Currently, we have a very centralized system. I'm talking about the United States, but this is true every, 
el everywhere else in the world right now. We have a very centralized patent system. The PTO in the United States and other patent offices around the world have, um, have taken control of all the important functions, or almost all, of the patent system. They do the examination, so they decide which invention gets and which one doesn't get the patent. It also controls the record, the patent record. So it's, uh, uh, the, patent is the, the PTO tells the world what inventions exist uh, that receive patents, and it also conducts post-grant reviews. This is a whole closed system, all managed by one company, and, uh, uh, and this creates some very severe problems. First is a production problem. Think of the bottleneck that the PTO becomes when all the inventions that want to assert some kind of property rights must go through this one channel of, of the PTO. This is huge. And it, it used to be that you could get a patent within a month and a half in the very early time. Now it takes over four years and sometimes more. So uh, this is a very big problem. It also increases the cost. Think also about some uh, distributive effects. Think of, uh, of Intel or, or some uh, medical company that can invest all this time and get all these lawyers to conduct, to conduct uh, all this long process. But think of a startup company that has to decide whether it puts the money into registering a patent or it puts it into growth of, uh, of user count. This is very tough decisions and a lot of startups have to give up on the, on the patent protection that they get in order to get other metrics done. So this is the productivity problem. Another problem is the quality problem because the PTO doesn't actually make uh, the, the best decisions. It has a very high error rate and uh, th this is very well documented. Um, we have false negatives, we have also false positives. Most scholars are most, mostly worried about false, uh, false positives and there is a reason why a centralized unit one, uh, creates, um, uh, creates a lot of false positives. One of the reasons is that um, uh, think about it that it, uh, the, the PTO examiners are former scientists, but they're not scientists anymore. They have done it maybe five, ten years ago, but right now a lot of inventions that come for them to see are very new and very exciting for them. The industry might have known that this is not very new, but for them this is very exciting. So they often, this is one reason why they often create uh, a lot of false positives. They give more patent than they should. This is the quality problem. And the third one is the patent record. And this is critical because the record is very important. The, the goal of the patent system in the end of the day is to allow more ideas to come, into, to, come to the market and more, uh, more technology to arrive at, uh, in the market. But what's, what happen, what hap, what's happening now with the patent record is that um, uh, companies or patentees do not have an incentive to, to let the world know about the inventions very, very fast. First, because the examination process is so slow, the publication is also very slow, this is obvious, but also um, it, takes so, thank you, it takes so long for, for the patent system to, um, to, uh, to, to do what it needs to do that the patentees say, well, it's better for me to keep it to myself until I see the results and then technology that could have arrived to the market just never does. Um, another reason is that uh, the PTO doesn't have all the information that is going to make the record helpful for people. For example, uh, imagine that we could have uh, information about licenses on the record, that we could just pick up the phone to a company and say, hey, I can help you with, uh, so with uh, uh, selling your invention in this and that country. We currently do not have this system because this is the PTO doesn't have this system. If, uh, if we didn't have a very central system, this could have been uh, done. So. Um, a de uh, an, another option and the better way forward would be to create a decentralized patent system. Um, the first question that the, the paper asks is uh, how does one even decide between a centralized and decentralized system? What are the criteria? And um, uh, the point is that you, um, the, the decision is a decision of, uh, in the end of the day, of uh, balance and optimization. It doesn't have to be a very uh, bright line one. And, uh, and the criteria that, that, uh, that I'm relying on are three. One is the information. What information does the system need to rely on? Does it need to rely on institutional knowledge, on uh, precedence, on these things? Centralized systems are, are much, much better than decentralized one that everything is, uh, the information is very hard to maintain. On the other hand, and, and this is what I think about the patent system, 
Uh, some systems are better when they don't need any information from uh, precedents. They need to check ad hoc information about the current uh, the current uh, question that they have, and this is what the patent system does. The heart of the process is to, to examine the difference between what I have now in front of me, the new invention, and the science that preceded it. Uh, the, the market or a decentralized system is much, much better in finding us all this information. It's also much better in getting diversity of, of, um, uh, of people who have more information about these things. Um, the, second, um, the second criteria is the decisions. Are we more interested in uniform decisions that are going to be see, uh, the same, that are going to create uh, um, ex ante uh, certainty for new actors, or are we more interested in correct ad hoc decisions? And, uh, and the paper argues that, uh, that with the patent system, uniformity is important, but it's not very important. What is important is that um, we do not create more monopoly than we should. And therefore, we need to create a good decisions on an ad hoc uh, uh, basis. And on these things, um, uh, decentralized systems are better. And the last point is the decision makers, because um, decentralized systems usually work with uh, different people who can who can self-assign themselves to self-assign themselves yeah to to uh, to two projects. While a centralized system usually works with uh, with um, people who are employees of the system. They get salary. They get promoted if they do a good job, or they do not get promoted if they do not. And again. Um, uh, I believe that uh, with the patent system, if we do move to a decentralized system, we're going to be able to to create a much better work with uh, with the um, uh, with a decentralized system and uh, expand on this uh, much more on the paper. Uh, a little bit on uh, uh, and and this is um, this is the important part. How is this going to work? There are many many questions that uh, needs to be answered. Uh, how we make sure that. Uh, uh, how we make sure that uh, patents are secret, how we make sure that the decision makers have the right incentives, how we make sure that there are no biases or conflict of interest. All these definitely need to, uh, to, be, uh, to get answered and I can answer on, on the Q&A or uh, on the paper. But uh, what's important for me to say is how it's going to work in terms of uh, also AI. Because with examination, thank you, with examination um, specifically, we have, um, we have two stages. At the first stage, we're going to have people from the industry making patent decisions uh, that are going to be like today. Today, when the PTO makes a patent decision, this is not a final decision. This is uh, a prima facie uh, decision, and it can be changed by court or by other decisions uh, of the PTO. This is not going to change. And we, I believe that industry people can do a much better job than a uh, patent office uh, officers in, uh, in doing this job. So this is going to be their job on the first stage. But this is not going to be enough because it's on the blockchain and everything that they do is recorded and everything that they do is, um, uh, is being learned. The second stage of the, prog uh, of, uh, of the issue can take AI much more seriously. Because think about it that AI has, can already do some things better than humans. For example, it can identify prior art much better. Uh, it takes uh, the PTO uh, a lot of time um, to find the, the, the relevant information that a machine can do in a much, much better way. And there are already some uh, startup companies that try to work in this direction. Um, but finding, uh, finding prior art is very easy for, for a system to do. The interesting question is whether an AI can also mimic the good decision making of patent of uh, of, of uh, uh, patent examiners and make better and more accurate decisions. So it definitely it, uh, the AI can definitely make much faster decisions and it can definitely make better decisions on something that has already that the, that was already seen uh, a lot of times and make less mistakes. Of, of cases that are already known. The, the, the questions that's, that, uh, that are left are one, uh, would AI be uh, able to avoid some of the biases that we know that patent officer, uh, officers currently have? These are biases that are usually uh, less typical of, uh, of machines to make. For example, uh, we, know that, um, we know that currently the PTO is 
is usually giving less patents to people of color and people of a certain gender, uh, mine, and, uh, and we know that, uh, that these things are easier for machines to avoid. Some, th some biases, as, as, uh, as we know and learned today, some biases tend to come into the machine. So we need to, to know whether an AI can be better on, uh, on biases. This is, uh, this is point number one. And number two is whether it can make more accurate uh, decision making. And what I argue in, in the paper by analyzing all the potentiality criteria is that probably AI can, in the end of the day, with a good training, uh, and this is why it needs stage one of, of patent uh, uh, of, uh, of pa patent examiners who actually do a good job, um, can actually make uh, more accurate uh, decisions. So um, this is uh, the idea of the paper. If uh, if anyone is interested, it's a very good time uh, for me to get feedback. It's uh, it's uh, relatively early in the process, so there is one draft. Uh, and if anyone is interested, uh, I'll be very happy to get any feedback. And thank you very much for listening. So uh, thank you very much first for having me here. It's my first time in Israel, first time in Haifa, so it's actually fantastic to be, to be here and to, to have a chance to present my PhD research. Um, so actually today is very, is very good for this topic because uh, during the lunch break we had a lot of examples of AI and uh, uh, art. Um, let's call it machine learning and art, because that's the term I will be using in my presentation. And also our first keynote uh, is extremely rele relevant for the things I will base my, um, my presentation on. Therefore, they, they did a good favor to me. I will, I, will base, I will take it for granted that you listened to the first keynote. So first, uh, to give some examples. Uh, one cannot do a presentation on copyright law, uh, machine learning, and creative output without testing the audience and showing actually some examples. So I'm going to show you two works and very quickly, uh, by a show of hands, I want you to, to tell me how many of you think that this one was generated by, was created by a, a human being? Please raise your hand when you, if you think this was done by a, by a human. Nobody? Great. Um, this was actually generated by, uh, maybe you know of it, at the University of Cambridge. Um, it w it's an example from 2017, and the article that explains all of this research is actually entitled Neural Network Poetry is So Bad, We Actually Think It's Written by a Human. Um, so, you, you were a good audience. Um, the second one, how many of you think this was, uh, this was written by a human? I see some shaking of, of heads, and one, two people raise their hand. Um, this, is a, this is a work by Emily Dickinson uh, from the late 19th century, um, an American poet. So I have space for my presentation today. Um, moving on to another example. One cannot do a presentation uh, on this topic and not mention this, uh, this project, which is called actually the next Rembrandt. If, uh, I'm sure that some of you probably have heard of it. This was a machine learning algorithm in the Netherlands in 2017, and the software, software was fed with all the works of Rembrandt he had ever created. The software analyzed the works for around 500, more than 500 hours, and a 2D image, what you see currently on the screen, uh, was produced eventually, and uh, eventually that was printed into 3D, so we have actually a physical painting. Um, without spending too much time of it, on it, you see that this looks quite realistic, but it was generated by a machine learning algorithm. Um, the next one uh, was mentioned during the lunch break, and this is Edmond de Bellamy. Um, saving some of my talk here, I just want to point to uh, the price that it was sold for, because that's going to be important for, for the points I want to make today. 
so one sentence, this was a system fed with, with 15,000 portraits between the 14th and the 20th century. And uh, eventually it was auctioned by Christie's, very famous auction, uh, auction house, and it was sold for nearly half a million. So my point here is that there is certainly a market for that kind of things, because they sell for not very little. And um, in the words of Christie's art specialist, um, AI is just one of the several technologies that will have an impact on the art market in the future. But I would like to turn to the copyright ownership and authorship claims actually and to see who gets the right to commercialize that kind of works. And uh, looking behind the AI veil, I base my, my talk on what uh, Avi said in, our, in his keynote this morning. So we have to specify what we're talking about here. It's not artificial intelligence only. Uh, what is new and what boomed recent, in recent years, in the last 10 years, is machine learning. So previously, we had predefining, we were predefining the features of the sort outcome. This was the programmer coding the code and the algorithm and the outcome that he wants to actually get out of this program. Whereas now, we have uh, learning from examples, and this is as opposed to uh, defining a priori what the objects are going to be. So we feed the system with a lot of examples and eventually that system produces a creative output which gets commercialized somehow. Um, again, these points were, were really made a lot. We are collecting large amounts of data, we are feeding the algorithm with data, the learning algorithm extracts a pattern in the data, and eventually, the bottom line, most importantly, machine learning always uses data. So this is my context. Um, now I turn to the authorship uh, claims in EU copyright law and I, I have broken it down into a twofold analysis. But I want to just make a note that I'm sure that the things I'm going to say now, I take the EU copyright law system as an example, but uh, these will be relevant for other systems as well. But I would like to make my point precisely, that's why I use the EU framework. So we have a twofold analysis uh, when we look at copyright law. Um, authorship claims. Firstly, we look at the designation issue. So who actually is the author? And in the case of machine learning, can a non-living person be vested with an authorship claim in, in copyright work? And uh, secondly, uh, the originality test. Well, can a machine learning generated work be actually labeled as original at the end of, at the, end of the day? And again, this is under EU law here, what I'm turning to. Um, let's look at the first part. So, um, the designation issue, who could be our author? Internationally and on the European, in the European system, there is no one definition of an author. There is no one legislation that points, that says an author is a human being. Um, so that's the first point. But actually, it has been human authorship has been implied and academics have reasoned from different sources saying that we have some hints within our copyright law frameworks that point us to the fact that the, hu that the author has to be human. More in particular, uh, duration of copyright law is linked to the life of a human being and secondly, moral rights. We have economic and moral rights in copyright law. Moral rights are linked to the human being. They are linked to the personality. And um, Secondly, I would like to make this point very quick, uh, that there are traditional uh, justification theories for copyright law as well as in general for intellectual property law um, that actually tell us that this has to be a human being uh, because the person that is incentivized, we have to incentivize somebody and the machine is not incentivized to produce creative works. So only humans respond to that kind of incentives. Um, also, um, the machine, um, an algorithm has no ability to exercise intellectual labor. Uh, that comes from another theory. And finally, uh, machines and algorithms do not, have legal, do not have personality in the same way as humans have. So these come all from, from different justification theories in copyright law telling us that we need a human being. So eventually, we have on the hand, on the end of designation, we have human authorship. The second end is actually the originality test. Uh, what does it mean for a work to be original under copyright law? Well, in Europe, for a long time, we didn't have one standard, uh, but uh, after 2009, we have this case telling us that a work is original if it constitutes the author's own intellectual creation. And, well, we still don't have 
any case or any um, legislation defining the meaning of creation. But let's say that we can work with that fixed definition because it has been quoted a lot in, in academia and in cases. However, there is a problem here. We end up with a circular definition when we talk about this. Um, the actual original character of the work is prejudice because we don't have an independent assessment of the work purely by the fact that we link the fact that the work is original to the existence of a human being. A work is original only if it constitutes the author's own intellectual creation. And we learned from the previous slide that an author is a human being. So the work, in my opinion, from what I've read and uh, what I appreciate, is that we, we don't give enough attention um, to the work itself. So therefore, we need to do we, perhaps we need to shift the focus when we look at the originality standard. We need to shift the focus from the author to the work. And in that sense, we can emphasize the level of creativity that is displayed of the, in the work itself independently of where it comes from, whether, if it, whether it comes from an author or from as a result of a machine learning algorithm. But this is the system that we have. And this is quickly to analyze, what we, what I, to summarize what I've just said. We have no human author, we have no copyrights, and eventually this leaves that kind of works that we saw over the lunch break that I showed you in the beginning in the public domain, strictly following the law. However, um, in that case, we have some practical problems I have identified. We get to experience and see that kind of, kind of works. So there are certain interests that need to be incentivized in the process. Not we, we cannot really point to one person saying that this is the person responsible, but certainly somebody brings this work to our attention, disseminates it to the public. So that person needs to have some sort of a reward so that next time they sit down, they, cre they, they get to bring us that work. I, said, I use the term bring to, to make the concept broader. But there are, my point is, there are some interests to be incentivized. Secondly, we have more, more um, real problem of licensing. When you're faced with two works, one within the public domain because it was generated by a machine learning algorithm, and one protected because it was created by a human being, how do you know as a user for which one, which one is which, and which one you need a license for? Well, some will say, okay, we have this problem for all kinds of works, right? We, not only for, for machine learning generated, but for, for all works, you don't know which one is out of copyright protection. The difference is that with that kind of algorithms, in my view, we're gonna have a lot more works that are generated by machine learning, okay, thank you, uh, that are generated thanks to machine learning algorithm, and this will undermine human authorship. So when you are a user and you're faced with a work when, the, when one requires you to get a license and the other one is free to use, certainly you, you pick the one that is, that is in the public domain. But the works that you're going to reuse are actually low creativity works because what these machine learning algorithms will end up producing fast, uh, extremely at a very, very high, very large scale, our creativity works, which display rather low creativity, but there are still there is still market for that kind of work, and um, we know that. I'm sure that you have uh, colleagues or friends who are in the creative industries, and you know that not every day there's a Picasso. Most of these artists actually do. Their, make their living by virtue of low creativity works. So that is a particular section of this creativity, creativity, is, creativity industries that is going to be affected and um, I think we need to turn our attention a little bit more to that. Um, to disappoint you, I don't have the answer. I have the defense of being only in the second year of this research, but uh, I have identified in my view that this is a problem. So this was already said in um, uh, in 1985 um, that we need to adopt a practical solution that makes sense not only in terms of doctrine but also in terms of realities and this was back in the context of computer generated works um, but it's very relevant today in order to understand what it actually means we need to understand machine learning and to focus our attention to that um, perhaps most of you were looking forward to answer 
to this question. These are some of the potential authorship and ownership claims, um, but uh, due to restriction of time, I will limit myself here. I just want to say that the process that we have in machine learning is so different to what we had before, and it's strongly reliant on data. And this leads to the fact that none of these solutions are actually practical, and they, they don't make sense in, in the context of the technology that we have. Um, so maybe we should uh, stretch it a little bit and apply legal fictions. Um, copyright law knows of that kind of legal fictions. In particular, and this is going to be probably my last sentence, there is uh, uh, section 9.4 of the UK Copyright Act in the United Kingdom, um, which grants uh, certain rules for computer generated works and also there is the doctrine the U the US doctrine for works made uh, for hire so these are legal fictions which allow us to to separate um, the the work from the author and to build a bridge in different contexts differently but uh, works made for hire thanks to a thanks to a contract, thanks to a covenant. So my thinking is that in these circumstances, maybe we need to start thinking about these kinds of bridges if we want to keep the system of copyright law as we have it now, as I have presented it to you. And with that, um, I am finishing. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Can you go to my walk? Well, good afternoon. I think I'm so happy to be here. This is my first time in, in history. So thank you to the organizer and of course, Yoni, thanks for all the effort. So I think I have a good background to stand on because, okay. Can you hear me now? Is it better now? Okay. So I think I have a good background to stand on because nearly everyone who has spoken has actually given me a, a circumstance on which I can build my thoughts. And of course, let me just start by saying, I know these are not good slides because I just put them together this morning. I was thinking I was going to speak to my paper, but I think again that it's important you follow through with me by looking at some of the slides I've, I've provided. Now, I need to lay a background. I'll be speaking of the brave new world legal questions for an artificial intelligence dominated society. Can you see it? Huh? Okay. Let me enter a caveat before I move forward. I'll be speaking this afternoon more like a legal prophet in the sense that most of the issues I'll be discussing may not really be what you can see now happening. But definitely, there are possibilities they will happen. Just like at the time it was, nobody intended that was, a man was going to land on the Mars or on the moon. But today, it's a reality. And so instrument law being an instrument of social engineering, I believe that it is also important the law is not reactive, but at the same time, proactive to see the changes happening in the society and how that can be tackled. Now. I want to look at the, the brave new world. We're going to look at AI as the fourth industrial revolution. Then I will look at the new frontiers of AI, and then go to the legal questions, and of course, I will conclude. We understand by, when, when we look at the frontiers that AI is extending and the development happening, you will understand with me that AI is operating more like the next Fourth industrial fourth revolution. Now, when you look at it, I say, given the sweeping changes that the AI is introducing to our world, it may be reasonably considered as the new fourth industrial revolution because AI is penetrating through the whole gamut of our lives. You can talk about agriculture, you talk about law, talk about engineering, talk about every aspect of human life. 
And because of these changes being introduced by AI, you can see the world is moving forward to another realm entirely. And I think the, it is high time the legal world also begin to think about what will be the regu um, regulations to be put in place to address this development. Now, I move forward. Part of the new frontiers being introduced by AI is robotic as a scene. We can be asking questions about how safe will our world be? Currently, robots are being developed far beyond the robot we used to think that were working in factory and of course, just automated for industrial purposes. To the extent that robots are now being developed to become more like human beings that is capable of having brain and of course, program for, for assassination. This, like I said before when I started, may not be happening now, but it's a possibility that is going to overtake our world in no, less, in no longer distance from now. And so, like I said, we are projecting. And if you look at the developments happening in, in, in AI in the world, you will understand that this is becoming a possibility. Then we can look at the spying drones. If you look just a few years behind us, if you wanted to catch a nice picture of IFA, you probably need to take an helicopter. <laughs> but now we don't need that. I don't think you need to stress yourself to go over an helicopter in order to catch a good area picture of the city. All you need to do is to de deploy drones. And if you look at that, that may seem to be a very innocuous venture. But at the same time, drones are not just being deployed now to capture pictures and of course to make videos. They are being deployed for the purpose of espionage. And this is going to raise question as to privacy and of course our data privacy, which Elena has spoken so much about. Now, you, you can also look at robotic soldier in the world without conscience. Now, we have a lot of conventions, especially made in Vienna, relating to how wars are to be carried out by belligerents. And the presumption of this convention is that war will always be fought by human beings. In that sense, you have provisions in those conventions stating who could be killed, how she should handle pregnant women, how children should be handled, how civilians should be handled in war situations. But you will understand that in our current war, robots are also being developed to fight war without necessarily having the interface with human beings. And of course, because of this de the deployment of robots, the question we should be thinking about or asking is, to which extent will this robot comply with those conventions which provide for prevention, protection of civilian, protection of children and those who are not, who do not qualify to be military objects during war. Then you can look at also autonomous car. I'm laying in the background the questions I'm going to raise them. I just want to situate my question in a particular balance for us to understand what I'm actually talking about. Now we understand that autonomous cars or self-driving cars are no most news to us. And in no, few, in no longer period from now, they will be deployed. Of course, there are a lot of tests being carried out. And of course, auto companies are developing technologies that will enable this to actually happen. Now, these are part of the new frontiers being introduced by AI. And as I move forward, we're going to see the questions this may pose to us and how we need to address them in the legal world. Now, we talk about this could be funny to us. Actually, time in Silicon Union. It could look somehow strange, but at the same time, we have seen occasions in which people are getting married to artificially intelligent dolls. And we should be thinking about it, even though it may not appear so real to us. And of course, like we all understand, in the US about 50 years ago, nobody would, would think that there will be new definition of marriage. But of course, just a few years ago, the Supreme Court has redefined the marriage act. And these are things that will happen. And of course, people are already getting married to those because they don't want to be involved in relationship with, with a partner with an human being. And as this develops, we're going to look at what will be the legal implication of this. How would the law address Silicon Union based on my coinage? I just decided to coin this to be Silicon Union. What would be the situation of this or the position of this in law? Now, let's look at, if we also look at business landscape, 
AI has introduced a lot of a lot of new challenges. You look at in marketing, you look at in advertisement, in every aspect of business. AI is sweeping through and introducing new challenges and new opportunities. And the question we also should be thinking about is how prepare is the law to address these new innovations being introduced by AI. Now, let me go quickly to the questions because of my time. Now, the first question I think is important for us to look at is who is an AI machine? I think this question sounds grammatically challenging, if not ludicrous, on the face of it. Because when you say who is AI machine, you are probably thinking or probably trying to ascribe personality to, to an AI system. And again, I think with my pedestrian understanding of English, it may not be correct to say who is a computer. What you will think about is what is a computer. But when you look at what AI is capable of doing and what AI has actually been doing, in the sense that there are a lot of, a lot of, a, a, um, what I mean by there are a lot of um, inventions, a lot of upheavals being introduced by AI into human world to the extent that I can be able to define AI as artificial man then you begin to think, what is the law thinking about to be the personality of artificial machine? Now, I put it here that the tentacles of law have not been stretched to encapsulate the definition of computer as possessing legal personality, even though computers now exhibit superhuman intelligence. We just listened to, I think, Lena. She was talking about machine learning generated artwork and all that. And like I was discussing with the professor when I came, I think recently I was listening to Saris Mfari Sakaria on CNN. It was showing some artwork being generated by artificial intelligence machine. Now, when you think about it, we could also think that this machine was actually invented by human being, but there was no human interface in the creation of those artificial work. And so AI aside from just creating those artwork. There are also a whole lot of things that AI is doing without the interface of man, independent of human interface. And in such instance, if AI lacks legal personality, we all understand from pedestrian understanding of law that legal personality is actually the bedrock of your legal recognition. In fact, in law, a child is deemed not to be capable of committing an offense if the child is duly incapable. I think on that, Criminal, under criminal law, once a child is probably less than eight years, even though the child actually commits an offense, the law deems the child is not capable of committing the offense. And so legal personality runs through the whole gamut of law to determine who is responsible, to determine the legal recognition, which is ascribable to a personality. And so in this instance, a high machine doing what law, what human being is actually ordinarily capable of doing, but still not being recognized by law, as a legal personality will pose a whole lot of challenges to us. Because you have situation, I'm, I'm going to address, and this is actually the bedrock of all the questions that I'll be asking in just a few minutes because of time. Now let's move forward. This question will keep on, re, re, keep on recurring in all the questions I'm going to raise. And of course, you have actually brought me here to raise questions, legal questions. And so I'm going to leave you with a whole lot of legal questions after this presentation, which we will continue to think about and see how we address them. Now, let's look at responsibility. In criminal law, you, call this, you could call this culpability. Let's look at a scenario of a self-driving car. Now, let's imagine a self-driving car bought by, let me call his name John, register on the platform of Uber, then insured by a popular insurance company, and of course made by a popular auto company. Now, one day, John, of course, has given this car to a driver. And of course, the car not being driven by a human being because it's actually an autonomous, autonomous car. Eat Jane. I believe nobody bears J in this place. And of course, there was an accident. The question which you ask yourself is who is responsible? 
the car driving itself, John who bought the car, Uber who got the car registered on its platform, the insurance company which insured the car, or the auto company. These are convoluted web of questions. Now let's try to address it. If we should say autonomous car is actually an AI that has legal personality, this is an assumption, then just simply thinking about it, then the car is actually responsible. Because by the principle of criminal law, we know the actors, reals, and the mens need to be present for you to determine culpability. Now, let's assume the car is being an AI, and let's assume the car also has legal personality, then the car will be responsible. But there is no law which has actually ascribed legal personality to any, any AI. And so we are left with other option. What will be the next option? You see John who actually allowed the car to drive itself or the auto company. Now, if it were John, John is going to raise other questions that the car actually is independent of its control. I have two, two minutes. <laughs> now I need to leave this because of my time. So this, what I'm trying to say here is that you have a whole lot of questions. The car also could raise, could raise a defense defense of intoxication. Maybe the program installed in the car was actually interfered with by virus. And so you're going to have a whole lot of convoluted issues relating to culpability. Now, let me just move forward because of my time. Who is the owner? I'm not going to address this because Elena has spoken so much about the ownership of data. But I want to call our attention to a case, Makaku Naruto versus Davis Later in the US. This actually happened. Davis Later was a it's a British photographer whose camera was actually seized by Makaku, which is a gorilla. And the animal actually used his camera to take a lot of selfies. And the selfie became a very cost costly picture that needed to be sold. Now, the association managing the, 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 the zoo actually took Slater to court to claim ownership of that picture. And the court said in the first instance that it is not the ownership of camera, it's not the owner of the camera that actually has the picture. Because what is involved in the work of art is actually the actual work in creating the heart. So it, be, it belonged to Makako. But when, you, when they went on appeal, the court actually heard that under the US copyright law, an animal does not have right to own a copyright. And so by implication, this copyright, the picture goes back to David Slater. If you bring that insight into the work created into, into, into work created by, by AI, that means that AI is actually incapable, like she has concluded, of owing, of develop of taking ownership of a copyright. Now I move just to say that who stole my data? This is also important when you come to issue of I think in 2017, you have a whole lot of issues about cyber kidnapping, where a malware was actually, ransomware was deployed to actually kidnap a whole lot of data. Now, when you ask, did the, did the ransomware actually launch itself, or it was launched by a human being? We just cannot a lot answer a whole lot of this question revolving around the bodies. But let's even assume that. There was a software developed to actually kidnap people's data and, of course, ask for ransom. My time is gone. Who will be responsible in handling those issues? Then the last question I want to leave you with is the status of marriage. Sorry, can you just give me one minute more? In the status of marriage, consummated, solemnized with an artificially intelligent dog. Who will be responsible? What, what do we say is going to be status of social marriage? And the question again we ask, if the law should ascribe legality and of course recognition to such marriage, will it be because such marriage was actually consummated between man and the artificial intelligence though? Or if that be the case, then we cannot validly say that the law has actually recognized such the personality of the artificial intelligence though because a human personality is actually involved. But we can stretch it from that to say that is it also possible for the law to recognize marriage between two artificially intelligent or in such instance the question of legal personality of of AI will further come to play. And like a round of let me just leave you with this with this with this statement because of time. 
as a veritable instrument of social engineering, the law must be steady, but must not be still. Thank you, and in tomorrow. Thank you very much to all our speakers. As you've heard, a really interesting um, presentation. And we have about just under 45 minutes left. So I want to open the floor to any questions. And we'll take them a few at a time. Yes. So, um, so one, one question is to uh, uh, about uh, so the idea of uh, data philosophy is that uh, Companies will, will somehow share data that is a resource for innovation, right? And so the question is whether uh, this is something, as we see the data become so essential, not only for innovation, but also for governance. The question is whether this is something uh, that, in, in your opinion, should be left for companies to decide whether it should be subject to regulation, and if you have any ideas about you know, how to stand for the regulation. Any other questions? Yeah. So in many cases, when we're talking about copyright, art, or even autonomous vehicles, um, we can think about the person who goes intelligent robots, <coughs> right? Who will um, deal with the money that will come from the arts creations or even if autonomous vehicles produces dam new damages, how we will deal with that? So I'd like to ask for the whole table, what's your opinion about that? We will need a new personhood for intelligent robots to do in those different areas or do you think it's not necessary? And we'll take one more. But, okay. <laughs> but um, thank you very much, first of all. And uh, the time uh, was very interesting. Could you maybe um, tell us a little bit more about how that could even be extended on an international level? So if you think about blockchain technology, it would be limited to the to the US. And um, Alina, um, could you, you mention at the very end the potential authorship uh, uh, claims uh, that are uh, in the discussion. I uh, find that very interesting and I was wondering which one uh, do you find the most convincing or what would be, uh, from your perspective, the path to Thank you. Panelists ask questions too, <laughs> yes, <that's right. laughs> because if we're taking all of them at the time, I also wanted to ask Alina if you think that we should, um, maybe because of these new developments, remove move the focus away from authorship and uh, and the work to the incentives of the copyright or the justifications of the copyright systems at large, which you mentioned. But I. I, I it kind of came back to me again and again that the justifications in Europe, it's more about personhood, which we don't have here. And in the US, it's more about financial incentives, which you don't have here as well, because the whole idea behind free ride is that it's expensive to create and cheap to copy. But here, it's cheap to create and cheap to copy. So I can see the economic incentive as well. Um, OK, I'll just answer the question that was directed to me, and then I'll pass it along. Um, Miva, I think, I think you're absolutely right, and maybe I should have started by saying that um, what we see today in the market is different forms of data sharing uh, or, or maybe different regimes of data sharing. So some of them will be mandatory for sure, and we see that. I mean, any, any situation at which you have a warrant or, or a situation that a court uh, requires you to share data, uh, and we have situations like that, 
that's a mandatory situation of sharing data. And we'll see more and more of these, and I think it's a different normative question of what set of, of or what types of data should be shared on a mandatory basis. But I think it doesn't matter how we answer this question, we'll always have the market segment at which companies are not required or should not be mandated um, to share. So I think uh, in any event, like on, on the normative question, I take your point, I think it's a different question of line drawing, but specifically it doesn't matter how you address it, you will still have the market segment at which companies are not obligated to share, and then we're going to have to deal with the questions that I brought up about privacy, corporate, uh, academia, and all of that. So can I just have a quick follow-up? Yep. The question is, if we, we talked yesterday a lot about the big five. The big five are not controlling the, the major resources of the world together with China, maybe, right? Mm -hmm. the numbers, the volume of data, the freshness of data, the uh, diversity of data, all of that data about many aspects of our life. This is a resource from which we should create all these wonderful things, you know, machine learning based, data driven innovation. Absolutely. Now the question is whether we should require them to share part of it. Not only the, the question is not about a warrant to disclose a particular piece of data, but whether 50%. 10% of the data should become available for others to share in order to compete. Or, you know, from the governance point of view, whether since they are governing all aspects of life, maybe a chunk of it, at least, we talk about transparency. Transparency is another way to say, tell us, give us the data. We want to know what it is that you're moving, what it is that you are uploading, how it is. This is data, right? And so yeah. The question is, What's the role of regulation in this? And if the lot of people would be would apply to something that is no one care about, right? Then Yeah, no, I see your question. I think it goes back to the discussion we had last night about a about how regimes influence innovation. When you're China and you can demand to get this information and you don't have democratic um, ideas or, or, or um, you don't see freedom of the markets as, as a principle that you should um, take care of, um, I guess, yes, you can get your hands on any kind of data. But in the US, that's not the, the, the view and not in Europe as well. So it goes back to the question of how you view the regime. Um, whether we should ask or demand access to this data for innovation purposes, I'm not talking about the government right now, this is a proposal that's in, that's in discussion in these very days. Victor Meyer Schoenberger has a new book exactly on that, saying that for innovation purposes we must require not just the big five, but all companies to share data and create a main data pool from which ev everyone can access and innovate. So I think it's it's a bigger question than data philanthropy, but my point is that no matter what the answer is, there will still be a market segment at which we do not mandate, and then these questions are still relevant. No, I think it's coming to Thank you for uh, this very good question about the international nature of um, uh, maybe blockchain-based uh, patent record. Um, it's very it's very tempting because a blockchain doesn't doesn't have to have limits. It doesn't have to have boundaries. It doesn't have to have you know uh, guards in the beginning to stamp any passport. Um, and it is very tempting. And on the other hand, there is always the question of uh, localization because. Some countries may have different patent agendas, uh, regardless of, uh, of whether the, uh, the the patent examination system can be can be internationalized. You know what I'm just second. Um, do you hear the feedback? I don't know where it's from. I just I just. I don't know, there is some feedback on the... I think it's some... Yes, no, no yeah, feedback. Um, uh, no, it's good. Oh. Yeah, um, so, so then, uh, thank you. 
So, uh, um, so then we, we need to decide, it's, I think it's a, it's a different question that we need to decide. Do we want some countries to have stronger patent protection on drugs and some other countries to have uh, maybe a looser one? Do we want uh, one country to have uh, uh, this uh, this kind of uh, this scope of protection and another country not to or do we want everything to be uh, internationalized and of course there are pros and cons to whatever uh, decision we, we choose but I think you're right that uh, if we if we use this uh, this idea then one of the advantages is that at least this becomes a possibility internationalized patent system becomes a possibility uh, and then we will need to decide policy-wise if this is something that we want. Um, thank you very much for the, all the questions. Um, and uh, first on the personhood of, uh, of, the, of the robot, let's say, who deals with the money. Well, in the case of copyright law, since I was looking at the, the downstream issues and who gets to commercialize the thing, I think everyone wants to get the claim. I think everyone wants to have the um, the, the claim that they are responsible for the acts of the robot, the machine, the algorithm, because they are the ones that will benefit at the end. It's a different story if we look at the input. If you are saying that you're the one responsible for generating the particular painting, you also naturally assume responsibility for all that data that was fed into the system. So if that data was already infringing copyright law, and if it was not, uh, clean because in the examples I've showed you it was let's say out of copyright works they had no issues there but if it was somebody else's work then I guess none of the potential authors will come up as a potential author and I guess the answer for um, for uh, driverless cars is, is even different to what I just said but can I just add something something that I think we have a twofold discussion in one side we have we have the liability problem because there will be no link between the damage and the one that produces the damage, a physical person. And on the copyright issue, is who creates the human being or the machine itself. So I teach intellectual property in Brazil, and our law says that author can only be a physical person. Hmm. And there are some cases, as you mentioned, like the Christie case, that the programmer said, we are not the authors, yeah. because the machine will uh, uh, deep learning techniques and so on. So in that case, we have two different theories in Brazil. A friend of mine, also a teacher, uh, states that in this case, this uh, thing... The first assumption that there needs to be an incentive, because every time we think about an incentive, it's either, like I said, a personhood yeah. one, because I create and I put my personality in it, that's the European approach, or some financial incentive, and in this case, we, n we have neither. Neither of them is, is part of the incentive system in, in uh, AI-generated work. So I, I think the first premise is wrong. Yeah. Is wrong. Yeah. It's the same in Brazil. When you finance something, or you not necessarily is the author of this something. Yeah. Oh, OK, just, just one aspect that's similar to look at. Talk about the autonom autonomous vehicle. In case of liability, I think under the current law, I'm not aware of any law that has ascribed um, legal personality to autonomous, autonomous vehicle or any form of AI. And so if there's an accident with the present legal regime that we have, I think we can still trace the liability to the manufacturer of the car. Because you can look at the link between them in the sense that of course, the autonomous vehicle could be viewed as an agent of the auto company by extension. And because, as it is now, since there's no legal personality ascribed to the car, and of course, the principle of the law is that there must not be a breach without serenity. And so, if you assume, if we say that, okay, the auto company is not responsible, then the person who suffers from the accident will actually be left without any remedy. And that is not the intention of the law. So looking at the current state of the law, of course, the auto company should be held liable for the accident. And we can be talking about insurance once that comes to play. Thank you. Are there more questions? Yes, yeah, so I have a question to you. This is, uh, so, so these are actually two questions. So one is, um, you advocate 
create uh, decentralization of the patent system, right? The question is why blockchain? I mean, and how is your idea different from uh, some proposals like uh, the initiative by Dez Nova, for instance, for outsourcing or distributing patent examination? Uh, how are they different? And what is the advantage of the blockchain here, actually? And I think, and, and, the, and the, the second question uh, relates to, uh, I think you made a very uh, interesting point as well, uh, the use of AI. And, and here I think that this, one can use AI for a patent examination without moving into uh, outsourcing the examination and doing this, uh, and, and using blockchain. And here, um, Again, the question uh, is uh, to what extent, you know, if, a, if, we, if we allow um, the use of AI, this is something that would enable us to still, I mean, we can use it as assistance to the examiners, right? We can require examiners to use such systems. We can hold them to a greater standard by using these systems. Um, and, and I think that is something that maybe should not even require any change in the law. I guess when uh, when people will use, when, when, when applicants are going to use AI for their search, inevitably the patent registry would have to be the systems as well. Are there more questions? No? Okay. Oh, yeah. Non-living, you said. Why yeah, did so I use? Non-living. Uh huh. Yeah. Why not? Uh, non-human patient. In the sense that uh -huh. the person, the person that just passed away, can also be attributed to the shit, right? So uh, maybe that was a justification. Helen. Thank you. Um, two great questions. Um, I'll start with the first about our blockchain. So indeed, there were other, the PTO is all the time under attack. Uh, since I think it was born, um, everyone was against uh, some things about it, and which is a great thing. Uh, and it's really, it, it does an important job and someone needs to criticize it, especially because it's so centralized. Uh, and there has also been some ideas to demonopolize the agency. I think uh, maybe the most famous one is uh, Daphne Abramovich from uh, uh, 2009 uh, at Penn. And, um, and, and, and there, there really it was different. It was, uh, it was creating some competition of, uh, of some other firms that will be able to also uh, um, uh, examine patents and then some competition will be around, whatever. Uh, good, good idea. But, uh, but this idea is different. And, um, the idea of, of using blockchain means to completely change the system. And um, uh, it means that uh, um, on the three levels that, uh, that I, I, I mentioned that, uh, that are going to have benefits, we're going to, to see a lot of improvements. Think first about the record, the patent record. Currently, the patent record is a static um, list of, of, uh, of uh, inventions 
that has the, the only information that it has uh, is is the the name of the invention, the the description in the invention, and exclusive licenses. Imagine what if we could enhance both the information and the functionality of the record. And this can only, it doesn't have to be blockchain, and I also say in the paper it can be some, a, a new technology can, can erase and do something different, but now blockchain is very fitting to, to what I think uh, we can achieve. Um, so uh, first we can enhance it with a lot of information that a, a central examination unit doesn't have. For example, uh, ex about licenses, about court cases. Imagine that we could know that uh, a patentee that is now threatening us as a startup company and says, hey, I have a patent, you should stop doing what you're doing. Imagine that we knew that they now uh, filed 10 lawsuits against other startup companies, companies and they were all uh, denied. This is something that is now very expensive to find out. But if we could have courts add information to, to the record and have patentees add information about licenses to the record, the record could be something much more helpful than it is now. But this is just step one. Imagine the functionality changes that we can have. With a blockchain, we can have smart contracts in, a, uh, in the system. Smart contract, contract is just one example for something that we could do to autonomously uh, use the record to create value. Imagine that, uh, that if we think that uh, that our product, instead of developing an, uh, something in-house, I can use a patentable technology and uh, just pay something and then uh, reach faster innovation, I could just do it. Right now, I need to first understand what exists on the record, which is very hard and very expensive, then to find out who the owner is, then to find out if they even have available licenses, then to negotiate it separately. It's, it's a nightmare. People don't do it and it's not, uh, it, it's not a coincidence that more than 90% of the patents today are not commercialized at all, in, in no way. So if we could easily, and this is something that the blockchain can easily do, enable uh, enhanced functionality in the record, we could really change the way that uh, the patent system exists. And I think this is very different from uh, other, um, other options that were raised uh, in the literature so far to uh, just challenge the PTO in order to make the PTO who does a, a better job. So the changes are in the examination, as it may, maybe uh, I was clear on this before, um, but also so to have more accurate uh, decision making and to have uh, the right people on board to make the decisions, but also in, in really changing the way that patents work in, the, in society. And this, of course, has all the, the different, uh, all the effects and uh, incentives to create if we believe that patents have some links in such a great and, uh, uh, or to, in, in, or to an event. Um, to, to the second uh, question, and, and it relates also to, to the blockchain, uh, why do we need AI? Uh, and is it really connected? So, um, so I, I wasn't, and maybe, maybe need to go back to, uh, to debating, to debating whether, uh, whether this is one project or two projects, because they don't necessarily need to be linked. I mean, if we, have, if, if we take this idea of decentralization, it can definitely be linked and should be linked to AI. Um, but, but we can also use AI without it. We can also just add AI to the way that the patent system uh, works right now. Uh, there is a reason that I thought that, uh, that there should be a decentralization as a first step. And the main reason is the training of an algorithm because AI systems are as good as the data set that we feed into them. Uh, the PTO now is known to have biases uh, of all kinds of them, I, I, you name it. I, I, I was talking before about race and, uh, and gender biases, but there are also um, biases just for uh, wealthy corporations, uh, represented corporations, repeat players, and there, are, there is even data that uh, patent examiners and the PTO tend to grant more patents uh, the, uh, as they as they um, going to finish their service in the PTO and go to look for jobs in one of the big corporations that they gave patents too. So there are all kinds of biases that exist these days and these are not the ones that we want to train an algorithm on. And, um, and uh, if, if, I, if I make the case correctly that, uh, that we're going to have better cases uh, and better examination cases on, on the market, then this must be a first step for training an algorithm. And, and we don't want to be also too active in, in, in training. We, we don't want to say uh, only take core decisions, not only because core decisions are also sometimes flawed, but also because there are very few core decisions and they tend to be very focused on specific areas or specific industries. 
and uh, and if we if we give um, an algorithm a view uh, and for for a long time and 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 the way that good decision making is happening plus we we add the corrections of PTO uh, overview and court overview I believe that we can have an AI system that is actually going to be better than what we have now um, I, I would love to maybe maybe offline also hear your thoughts if you if you think that, uh, it should not be exactly uh, on the same project or not right now it's uh, whatever. If you're interested, I'll, I'll let you know. But uh, but but there are uh, there, there are in the paper ways to also separate. Only take this decentralization and do not take AI. But an explanation of why AI without centralization is probably not the way to go. Alina, uh, Alina? No, I'm, I'm sorry. Can I just I, I I just didn't answer one sm small part. Is it okay? Uh, just a second. Uh, you asked if it would need a change in the law to do it right now. It will probably need a little bit change in the law, just in part of it. Um, it we, we will be able to use AI uh, right now to identify prior art and everything, but, uh, but uh, the law, uh, uh, even in the peer to, uh, to patent system that they use, have, the law now mandates that uh, only, only patent examiners are going to make uh, uh, obviousness decisions. So uh, on this part, which is the, maybe the core of the patent system, we will not be able to use AI. And this is something that uh, you know we, we may be missing the boat and, uh, and not using all the all the benefits that AI can provide. I think it was more from okay. okay, thank you. That was a good question. I just start by saying that when I advocate for legal framework for the regulation of the operations of AI. I was, I'm actually not saying that each, com each country should actually develop a set of laws. Not because that is not important, but when you look at it, the operation of AI actually transcends international borders. Because when you look at what AI is actually up to, there will, there will be a time when the operation of AI will actually affect the whole world irrespective of where they originate from. And I think based on that, this high time the war actually began to look at why legal framework need to be put in place. I think just last year, the EU Parliament made certain recommendation to the civil, to Commission on Civil Law and Rules on how to actually regulate the operation of robots. That may be a very good start. But I think the U UN actually need to also be looking at the need to make certain conventions and protocols on how to regulate the operation and the deployment of AI before it becomes too late. And so I'm not actually saying that those laws need to be situated within the jurisdiction of a country, but it is important we begin to look at the need to create a legal framework for the regulation of AI. Do I answer your question? What I mean, that's exactly what I'm saying, that there should be international convention. And of course, international. when we talk about international conventions today, the first body that comes to mind is the United Nations. Of course, there could be regional conventions by, like you have in the European Union. That's a regional, regional intergovernment um, organization, intergovernment organization. And that discussion has actually started, at least from my research, from the EU. I think that is a good development. And we know based on the nature of international law, once you have convention, that is not me the convention is necessarily binding on all the member country that actually subscribe to it. For example, in the US, and I think the same system in Nigeria, you actually need to incorporate or domesticate those conventions to be part of your local laws for them to be enforceable. But what I'm saying is there needs to be a step to be taken. It could be somehow difficult for us to expect that each country will sit down to make laws regulating AI. I think the first move could just be made by the United Nations or regional intergovernmental organization like the EU. Then the domestication and of course incorporation of this convention into their local laws becomes easier. And that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, be more specific in some conversation 
Exactly, I agree with you 100%. But when you talk about international law, you know one of the weaknesses of international law is the fact that you talk about international politics, then you talk about parity of nations, you talk about industrial disequilibrium. Now, we can be saying this, maybe the EU countries can have, let me say, like you have said, with a stronger position of law. But when you go to places like African nations, where the competitive advantage is actually very almost absent, then the, the issue of actually enforcing those, as in those laws, those regulations, those conventions becomes very problematic. And so that's why you see, when you, when, you, when you see such economies that are not so much industrialized, they will continue to have this problem of dumping, problem of enforcement of those conventions and all that. But you know, it is still important we have a framework in place. And I think the higher time, the, the earlier we do that, the better. Because it's going to probably get back if nothing is actually done. So we have five minutes left. And I haven't um, responded. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, but it's going to be a very short one because I admit that <laughs> this was an oversight on my point. And you have a point. Maybe it's 
great because I am in my research process, so I can turn my attention to that. So maybe I should have used the term non-human in uh, in the things I was talking about because we, in particular, we had the we had the monkey case, monkey selfie case in the United States. So that's a living but non-human. Mm -hmm. um, and exactly, you have a. You have and also, well, my thought is that your your establishing is not the standard that is not there. Mm -hmm. So much as in like breathing. Yeah, yeah. So, I understand. I have yeah. a question. Yeah. Uh, general also for, for you. Uh, thinking about blockchain and uh, coming from a copyright perspective, um, if we try to apply blockchain to, to copyright, because copyright is uh, arises automatically because I have a registration system of the kind that patents and trademarks have, do we clash with the Berne Convention of uh, no formalities or do we? Do we, are we free? Because I, I haven't done much reading and research on blockchain, but uh, something that came to my mind now. What would you use the blockchain for? Um, because in copyright law, when, especially on the internet, you disseminate works extremely fast. Mm -hmm. You don't know who the owner is. You don't know um, who to get in touch with if you want to get a license or permission. So you would have a blockchain system that records ownership. Mandatory so you will need one? to, yeah, exactly. You will need in order to work. It has to be mandatory, hypothetically. So absolutely. So the internet will yeah. be, if you publish it on the internet, it will be uncopyrighted, and if you publish it on the blockchain, then it is copyrighted. No, even yeah. if you publish it on the internet, maybe you that can would still be, register. You can still only only if you do. But if you only publish it on the internet, then it won't be protected. In either case, if we apply blockchain as a registration tracking of ownership uh, system. Do we clash with the uh, with the formalities no. requirement? I think we do. Yeah, but I'll let I'll let the experts. There are people actually. Who so, uh, so I'm working on that right now. Uh, in the like in the in the current system as it is now, the, the most the most probable thing that can happen is establish some sort of uh, joint. Like yeah, voluntary. Uh, registry of work that we kind of want to have that, but, but we haven't been able to because of different problems of collaborating with multiple collective societies and having them share their, their databases. Uh, so the, the short answer right now would be no, because any registry right now would be voluntary, and there is no, there's no one, nothing in the Berne Convention says that it would be the voluntary registries, uh, but I, I would say that we are very far away from actually making that become the the, 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 the reality of uh, subjugating the, the registration to uh, corporate protection. So I think that it would be a problem if that could be. But we're very far off. They um, they have a voluntary IP registration of uh, all IP, uh, copyrights and uh, patents, and the days that uh, you as an author can use it as a um, um, just a proof of uh, of date of uh, conception and day of ownership. It's not mandatory for mm -hmm. especially for very reasons. So it's been a really fascinating discussion and I'm very glad we've managed to have a conversation as well with everyone who's in the room um, and I think that's made the discussion so much richer um, I've really appreciated your presentations and what strikes me is that we have so many arguments to level against the critiques who say that regulation is anti-innovation um, inherently and I don't think it, it I don't think it necessarily is and I think what you've done today is really show that regulation is important it's just a how we're going to do that um, and my only concern is how do we get greater coherence across all of these different tools and mechanisms that we've come up with? And so in the last minute or so that we have left, I was wondering whether you have any closing remarks you want to make in a couple of sentences? Starting with wow. me, <laughs> It's a huge burden. Um, 
So I'll just respond to regulation and innovation. I think one of the things we tend to forget is that regulation responds to market failures most of the time. It, it, it depends on how you define a market failure, right? Sometimes you would say that a market failure is when a social optimum is not achieved, not, not necessarily an economical optimum. So I think um, at the end of the day, we need to understand that regulation is about fixing these market failures, and we do, do not have any data on which um, environment uh, kind of generates more innovation, the regulatory the, the one that is regulated or the one that is not regulated, because the one that is not regulated is a failed, in terms of market, failed one, and the other one is one that we're intervening is in, in. So it's really unclear. So I think those who claim that innovation, uh, regulation stifle innovation should be very, very careful and make this claim in a very nuanced matter in order to make a persuasive argument. Sure, uh, thanks. So I think my paper treats uh, the regulator as the provider of a service. It, uh, it, we, well, I'm talking about the PTO as a, a, a regulatory force that, uh, that, uh, that provides a service basically to, to society. So it's a little bit different. It's not a regulator as the controller of the market, but it's a regulator as part of the problem of the service that is created. And, uh, and I think in, in this case, it's, uh, it's maybe the opposite view of uh, allowing AI to fix some problems in the regulatory work rather than what we usually talk about, which is allowing the regulator to fix some things in the way that AI works. Um, so um, I think this year or last year, the European Commission established a high-level expert group on artificial intelligence and another one on liability issues dealing all with new technologies. And uh, in particular, the one on AI, they, they got together people from different backgrounds, not only lawyers. Um, and the, I, when they started, I was following the discussion, and the discussion was, well, for the first time, actually, the community wants regulation in that kind of field. They are not threatened by it. They, they don't say you know, innovation should be free, everyone should be, internet should be free. So they want regulation. They want some type of guidelines. Some months have passed, and now only the other, the other day I read uh, their, their chief uh, said that um, actually um, in that case it's very hard to have regulation and uh, perhaps they, can come, they will have to come up with ethical guidelines on artificial intelligence by the end of this year. And uh, you see the discourse moving to a certain way. People would like to have it, but the more important thing is, like you said, how to have it, how to have the regulation. And um, eventually they, they started saying that um, perhaps the model should be different, so something of the common law system where um, innovation technology and self-driving cars and different mm -hmm. things will come out, we see how they work, and then we will model mm -hmm. uh, the law around it. So perhaps that's the way we're headed to it. Let's see. Felix? When we talk about regulation, what I just want us to actually place our mind on is the fact that the law must not just be recognized or probably just reactive to development in the society. It's also important that the law actually focus and predict what is about to happen and prepare in order to actually handle the challenges arising from such development. So the issue of regulation will keep on coming up on and on until when AI is full blown. We all understand that here is actually a work in progress. But at the same time, it is a work in progress that is advancing at, its, at a pace which is beyond our conventional contemplation. And so it is important that we be all begin to think on what will be the regulation to be put in place? How will this regulation be enforced? And all other issues arising from here. I personally am interested in taking this discussion from that and seeing as AI unfolds, what will be the legal regime that will be available to actually address challenges or I think that's actually been nice being here. So thank you so much. Thank you very much to our panelists and to everyone. Thank you.